continuous land empire in history. Twice the size of Caesar's Roman Empire. Longer lasting than Napoleon's. As world shaking as Alexander the Great's. They are the Mongols. The fury that rolls like a storm out of the steppes. In the early 13th century, the Mongols pioneer a style of warfare unparalleled in cunning and cruelty and so revolutionary it still inspires military strategists today sweeping east and west destroying everything in their path they shatter the old world order and carve a new course of history It is the end of the 12th century. As Europe lies mired in the Dark Ages, two cultures set the standard for human civilization. The Islamic states in Persia and Central Asia. And far away to the east, a trio of fabulous kingdoms in China. Between these stretch vast, inhospitable grasslands, the Eurasian steppes. Although the steppes are formidable, they are not empty. Nomadic tribes, the Tatars, Mongols, and others, eke out a grim life. These are some of the coldest places on Earth in Mongolia. Temperatures 90 degrees below zero. So, for much of the year, they're fighting nature. It's a life with no, no margin of safety in it. In 1175, the Tatars renew an old feud with the Mongols. These two tribes, so similar in lifestyle and belief, are bitterly divided by ancient rivalries, a never-ending cycle of alliance, treachery, and revenge. Caught up in their own struggles, they ignore their common enemy, the rich and powerful Jin of northern China. The Jin Dynasty, their policy towards Mongolia was one really of divide and conquer. And the Jin would employ the Tatars on raids against uh, other nomadic groups, tribes, khanates that grew too large and too threatening. The Jin wisely perceived that as long as the people of the steppes are focused on each other, they won't trouble them. It is in this time of upheaval that great Mongol conqueror Genghis Khan arises in the 12th century. He does so not from a family of kings or princes, but as a fatherless boy facing death with his family on the barren steppes. Genghis Khan's given name is Timujin, Mongolian for iron worker. It's fitting. His life will demand an iron will. In 1175, when he is barely nine years old, his father, leader of the clan, is poisoned by the Tatars. For 30 grueling years, Timujin fights to unite his clan and gain the title of Khan, great leader. He learns to trust those proven loyal in battle, and he remains suspicious of all others. By the age of 40, he has grown to be a gifted chieftain. We're looking at a man like Alexander, like Hitler, I have to say, with immense charisma, 
who made people follow him by the strength of his personality. Having united his tribe in 1196, Timogen turns to the second task. Vengeance on the Tatars. By the year 1206, Genghis Khan's power over the steppes is unchallenged. Now he directs his vengeance on the wealthy and arrogant Jin of China. In 1211, the Mongols move to invade China. The enormous ancient nation sees them as scruffy upstarts out to stir up a little trouble. The Chinese have no idea what they are about to face. Within hours of their initial meeting, the Mongol troops annihilate a much larger Chinese force. The nomads learn fast. They copy Chinese siege technology to breach their city walls. They become the embodiment of terror. And then they start beating their drums. And these drums are carried by four people on ropes. And the mere sound of them drove people mad with fear. They brought with them the prisoners from the previous city that they captured and pushed them into the moat so that they could go over them, over the dead bodies at the city walls. And then they would slaughter every living thing, the very cats and the dogs. In 1215, they lay waste to the capital of northern China, Chengdu, present-day Beijing.
To, to, for for African Americans to go out and say that they're Native Americans, that is a uh, a misnomer, a falsehood, an outright lie, an outright lie, an outright lie. Okay, that's exactly what that is. We are not uh, the original Native American. There is a history that Native Americans have, and actually it's disrespectful. <laughs> what did you say, nigga? To, 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 for, for African Americans to go out and say that they're Native American to, to the rich Native American cultures that have been here for thousands of years. What? I mean, Native Americans are descendants of Asians. who came here, who migrated here. And we have the, the archeology, span we have the biological anthropology, we have the genetics, the fossils, everything is there show and prove, okay? So there is no debate on that. But not much compares to the experience of Albert Perry, whose genetic material offers new clues about the origin of the human species. An African-American man from South Carolina, Perry let a relative send in his DNA for analysis. But when the testing company tried to track his Y chromosome, they simply couldn't. Further research revealed that Perry's Y chromosome came from a lineage that broke off from other species about 338,000 years ago. That's long before the first Homo sapiens, or modern humans, evolved some 195,000 years ago, making our Y chromosome lineage much longer than geneticists believe. mutation to detect those mutations. By chance, the light skin colored fish that I used for that research also taught us a lot about how Europeans, how humans became lighter skinned. What Professor Chang discovered was perhaps one of the most important genetic mutations ever found. A single change among literally billions of coded instructions within zebrafish DNA that reduce black pigment from their stripes. Soon after, this identical genetic mutation was found in fair-skinned Europeans. There was a magic moment in this research. When I got back the results that showed that the number and the size and the amount of pigment in the light-skinned zebrafish were all diminished, and the same thing happened in humans, when I opened the textbook and saw that same thing, I began to sweat. Not only did light-skinned people evolve from black-skinned people, but lighter-skinned people, whether they're European or whether they're Asian, like me, were actually mutants, mutants, mutants of the dark-skinned people. We have the the archaeology, we have the biological anthropology, we have the genetics, the fossils, everything is there, show and prove, okay? So there is no debate on that. What? Prehistoric skulls were found buried in layers of soil nine to 12,000 years old. They are the oldest skulls in the Americas. And 
This is the oldest of them all. The skull of a young woman nicknamed Luthia by scientists. Can she tell us who the first Americans were? Walter Nevis is a physical anthropologist at Sao Paulo University in Brazil. He's been using a standard and reliable archaeological measure, the shape of the skull, to find out what race she belonged to. He fully expected Luthia to be a mongoloid, an ancestor of the American Indians. But then he fed the measurements into the computer. When we start running the computer and uh, seeing the results, uh, it was amazing because we realized that uh, uh, the statistics, the quantitative analysis we were doing was not showing just people to be mongoloid. In fact, the analysis was showing just people was anything except mongoloid. The first stage was to make a three-dimensional CAT scan of Luthia's skull in order to build a replica. The cast was then given to Richard Neve of the University of Manchester in England, one of the world's leading forensic artists, to recreate her features. That to me is a Negro face. That to me is a Negro face. That to me is a Negro face. Look at Native American populations. They were at one point very large with the, um, the settlement and the arrival and settlement of Europeans. Those, those populations were, were, were brought down to, to, to very few numbers. And so the genetic diversity, the biological diversity, the cultural diversity was lost, okay? But they were not of African, of recent African descent, okay? Those Native Americans were not. Now, for some reason, there are African Americans who are here who want to claim this connection with Native Americans. I don't know for what, outside of maybe trying to get some money from the casinos or something. I don't know, but, but the... the um, <laughs> the <laughs> they want to have this... Uh, connection with Native Americans. And it, it's funny because it's almost like there are no, we are the Native Americans. And so whoever was here or, or whatever history that you can show coming from Asia just wasn't true. I mean, which is, it's even more shocking that you would even say that. But I don't, and I also don't understand why a black person would want to be anything other than African. Okay? Mm. That's, mm. That is the deep, real deep sort of issue that has to be addressed by those individuals who continue to argue. I mean, they continue to argue this point. Now, I'm not going to say that no 
black folk came here when the Europeans came here early on, Columbus and all that stuff, right? Because I'm sure there was um, uh, black folk on those on those uh, ships. Mm-hmm. I'm almost positive that they were black folk. Mm-hmm. I'm even suggesting that some of them could have been Moors from Spain, okay? But there was no wholesale movement of black folk to the new world and then contribute all of what the Native Americans did. Uh, uh, and, 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 and for some reason, uh, that was lost, too, I guess, in the history that, you know, it was, a, it was the black experience that contributed to the Native American history. I don't know, but I, I'm just saying it, it's there is no there is no evidence of this uh, uh, wholesale movement of people of West and Central African descent being here before the transatlantic slave trade. African American community that's there today came from. We are the we are descendants. I'm, I'm going to say this really, just clearly. Okay. The bulk of African Americans are descendants of enslaved Africans from West and Central Africa. That's it. Mm. And by the way, you know, the Zulu thing, when we gave, when Oprah was finally in, in the first series and we gave her a DNA test, ba- basically the next day she went to South Africa to announce that she was opening her, what became the Oprah Winfrey Leadership Academy. She was in an auditorium of like 75,000 people or something and she announced that she just had the test and that she was Zulu. So I, it broke on CNN. I was sitting in my living room minding my own business and said, Oprah Winfrey's a Zulu. So I called Rick Kittles, and I said, Rick, did you tell Oprah she was a Zulu? He goes, no, man, she made that up herself. (laughs) 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 It's a true story, it's a true story. I would lie to make you laugh, but I'm telling you a true story. So I said, Rick, are you in your lab? He said, yeah. I said, is anybody there? He said, no. I said, when the results come in, make her Zulu, man. Make her Zulu, man. Make her Zulu, man. (laughs) (laughs) I said, you back there making it up anyway. You back there making it up anyway. You back there making it up anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Nobody believe you could take some spit and figure out a tribe. Nobody believe you could take some spit and figure out a tribe. Nobody believe you could take some spit and figure out a tribe. What are you, crazy? In tonight's Fox 32 special report, DNA kits called into question. They are the kind advertised on TV claiming to trace your ancestry. A woman says she used two different popular services to trace her family history and got wildly different results. Fox 32's Tia Ewing reports. This is my mother, Uh my father. Jennifer Smith says flipping through family albums helps her reconnect with the past. And I just want to learn as much as I can about my history. She recently took that learning one step further and decided to try a DNA testing kit. 
Ancestry.com, very popular. You know, they're in all of the commercials. Everybody talks about them. Smith received the kit, followed the directions, and mailed it back. Just like the lady on TV says, you have to spit in the tube. It's not ladylike, but that's what you do. Then she waited the four to six weeks. And I was shocked. Smith's breakdown from Ancestry showed 97% European and 2% Asian. I'm a black girl. I am not a Jewish white lady. I'm, I'm black. My parents were black. She contacted Ancestry with questions, but says a rep told her the results are accurate. She told me there was no way they could have made an error. Smith decided to try again, but this time she submitted a DNA to 23andMe. And the results were very different, but they were not a surprise to me. The 23andMe finding showed 70% African for Smith after Ancestry's findings showed none. Both kids can't be right. One of them has to be wrong. The, these DNA tests for ethnicity are entertainment value only. The, these DNA tests for ethnicity are entertainment value only. The, these DNA tests for ethnicity are entertainment value only. William Gilliland is a biology professor at DePaul. He says DNA kits can be great for connecting family members and finding relatives, but the science for ethnicity testing isn't as concrete. There's nothing that confident for ethnicity. There's no diagnostic nucleotide. You can say this person is from Europe, this person's from Africa. So what happened in Smith's case? The simplest explanation is that one of these test results is just wrong and the tubes got mixed up or contaminated or something. We reached out to both Ancestry DNA and 23andMe. Ancestry tells us it's incredibly unusual to find variations of this magnitude. The company says it's best guess that the tubes were mixed up before they were sent to their labs. 23andMe says because companies use different algorithms to make ancestry assignments, you can find differences when comparing tests from different companies. It's exciting to make discoveries like this, but if they're not true, it's heartbreaking. Tia Ewing, Fox 32 News. That is, that is a, a misnomer, a falsehood, an outright lie. Okay, that's exactly what that is. We are not uh, the original Native Americans. You better think about what you're saying. You better think about the consequences of your actions. There is a history that Native Americans have, and actually it's disrespectful to, 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 for, for African Americans to go out and say that they're Native American to, to the rich Native American cultures that have been here.
That is a, uh, a misnomer, a falsehood, an outright lie. These DNA tests for ethnicity are entertainment value only. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. That is a, uh, a misnomer, a falsehood, an outright lie. Oh, the, the deception, the betrayal. Negro, please. I would like to share with you insights into this larger history, into the lives of these early men of science and government in the 1800s, men who have altered how society has come to view and value the American Indian, America's ancient history, the mound building cultures of the Hopewell and Adena. For these early men of science and government came to realize that they could use these evolutionary ideas into the origin of man as a very powerful tool for social reform. These contemporaries of each other in the mid-1800s would introduce these evolutionary ideas and theories that would literally become revolutionary. Even though today many of these evolutionary ideas are credited to the likes of British evolutionary theorists, Charles Darwin, Huxley, and Spencer, here in North America were a group of men who were also exploring these ideas in the origin and science of man. These lesser known men were Constantine Raffinisk, Lewis Henry Morgan, John Wesley Powell. These early men of science and government would be faced with questions as to the origin of the American Indian and questions as to who built these massive uh, iconic structures. As they came to understand that how their views into the origin of the Indian and these mound building cultures would alter society's views on who had the rights to the lands of America. A man in the 1800s that would provide great insight into America's ancient mound building cultures and into the science of man was Constantine Samuel Raffinisk who grew up in Marcellus, France, 
but after a prior visit to America, Constantine decided to settle in America in 1815. He writes of his travels that he explored much of the Ohio Valley on Penable Foot. He tells that the primary object of his researches was to study the geology of the region, looking for precious metals. But something else began to attract his interest. He stated, I went on foot through the whole of Ohio by Chillicothe, Lancaster, Zanzville, and Steubenville. It was near Chillicothe that I saw first these great pyramids and alders of the ancient nations of North America. They struck me with great astonishment and induced me to study them." Unquote. As a prolific writer, Constantine authored three volume work, The American Nation, Ancient and Modern. It was printed in Philadelphia in 1836. In these books, Constantine stated, I began to study earnestly American history and archeology span of the, um, this American nation. I had met with the Oneida, the Choctaw, the Mohicans, Lanai Lenape tribes. My studies led me to view the whole of the primitive archeology span in order to obtain satisfactory results. It was Constantine who was the first to petition Congress to establish the Smithsonian which they did in 1846. Even though some of these early men of science and government didn't like this Frenchman, his work would have a real influence on Lewis Henry Morgan, E.G. Squires and others, for he not only brought the mounds scattered through Ohio Valley to the notice of the scientific community, but he developed a theory of evolution that predated Charles Darwin by 20 years. The department, founded by John Wesley Powell, was first seen as the science of man, exploring the origin and evolution of man along with the origin of the American Indian. As science historian John Hallard stated, the ethnologist of the 19th century thus walked an unstable course between science and assumptions. Ethnology became the means through which both scientists and social scientists sought to estimate the relative value of the races to help to justify dynamic race legislation, providing the justification needed to not give the Indians their rights under a constitutional law.